Hello again, welcome back to another day of daily Bible study. We're continuing on with the book of Acts. We're in chapter 9. We're going to start today in the second half of verse 19, and we're going to go on from there. Uh, it's one of these things where these numbers that were put in, they were put in by people after the fact, and sometimes they do a really good job of dividing things up. And every once in a while, you wonder, what were you thinking? And uh, it just is very clear that, that this, in the middle of this verse, we change uh, paragraphs, so to speak. Uh, so that's, we're going to see this a couple times this week. Um, but before we get into that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, uh, Paul was in such an interesting, interesting situation. Uh, so Lord, help us to see and to understand uh, where he's coming from. Help us understand what that's like. Help us to, to relate to that, not only in when we've seen it in other people, but when we've experienced similar things ourselves. And help us to see you at work, even when things are unexpected and strange. Lord, we ask you to be with us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've just been looking at Paul and... Um, and so anyway, what we've seen here, or rather we've been calling him Saul so far. And so he's a, a, a persecutor of the Christians. He's supervising people who are stoning Stephen to death. Uh, he's on his way to Damascus. He encounters Jesus on the way. Uh, he's been now been prayed for by Ananias. He's been baptized, and, and then he started to eat and all the rest. Um, and so now we're going to read about what he does with that. And it's a very interesting situation. You can almost predict all this. It says, now for several days, he was with the disciples who were in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is not this he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus, this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, uh, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesar, uh, Caesar, Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. So what we have here is we have this fascinating thing where Paul has a radical conversion, and that gives him a lot of trouble. Now, to a certain degree, um, that makes sense. You know, for part, part of this is because we can imagine how if he had been a Pharisee's Pharisee and he had put himself in that situation and all of a sudden he found himself at variance with what the Pharisees were teaching, he kind of found himself switching sides, uh, you can imagine that his uh, former friends are not going to be very happy with him. We see this at various points throughout church history. Uh, the one that leaps to my mind is a guy named Jacob Arminius where he was sent to kind of uh, to, to disprove uh, what a particular um, view of predestination was, and in his study and learning, he decided that actually he agreed with it, and he became one of his uh, most ardent supporters within the Reformed tradition. We see things like this uh, with some frequency, um, and it does, and it makes sense to think that you know, and and in America, you know, one of the one of the the earliest infamous people in America in in uh, the political American history is uh, uh, Benedict Arnold, you know, who was a traitor, you know, and he and the thing is, we have more kind of anger and distaste for someone like Benedict Arnold than we do for anybody who was on the British side from the beginning because there's something about, it's one thing to be an enemy, it's something else to be a friend and then betray your cause to your enemies. And so here we have Paul who is, to read this back an anachronistically, he's kind of being the Benedict Arnold of the Pharisees, that he's not just um, he's not just on the other side like anybody else is, he, he is a betrayer, he is seen as being a betrayer to the, to the cause. Um, and also what's really interesting is that, that Paul has this background where he knows the Pharisees' points. And so having lived them and having indwelled them and having really studied them from the inside out, he knows exactly uh, what points he has to make to be able to argue against them. And that's the, the, the importance of really understanding those with whom you disagree and those with whom you are debating is it cannot be overstressed. Um, you know, one of the most important theologians in the last several hundred years was a guy named Karl Barth. Now, he, he's, he's a, a complicated person. Um, he, he had some significant moral failings, and so I don't want to just simply say everything about Karl Barth is great by any means. But theologically, um, 
and Ramsey can't always bracket out someone's personal life from the theology, but, but for the moment, bracket out his personal life and focus on his theology. And one of the things that's fascinating about him is that he grew up and was educated in the heart of German um, theological liberalism. And, and, and when, I, when I talk about theological liberalism, I don't, that does not map uh, to political or social liberalism. There are lots of people who are theologically liberal and are uh, politically conservative, and there's a lot of people who are theologically conservative, theologically traditional, who are politically liberal. So th these two things do not map onto each other at all. But the issue that was going on in Germany was a lot of uh, people were teaching essentially that Jesus is just a guy, just a guy. Now, Orthodox Christianity wants to say Jesus was a man, you know, was a man just like us, but was also God. And so Bart is raised in the heart of this whole perspective. He learned how people read the Bible, how they argued about things, and all the rest. And through a variety of experiences, comes to take up a radically orthodox position theologically. And what made him such a um, ferocious opponent to his former understanding of how uh, theology worked, uh, to the point where, literally speaking, we can talk about Protestant theology um, before Bart and after Bart because he's such a, a dividing line. Um, he doesn't, part of the reason why he was so effective in that is not just because he was a towering intellect, he was, but also because uh, he knew the position he was arguing against so well because he had been in it, he'd been educated in it, and he, everyone he knew was part of it. And so it really is vitally important that we realize what that means. So, so Paul is not trusted by his Pharisees because now he's become their most ferocious opponent because he knows what they're going to say before they even say it, and so he can even... Uh, argue against it you know, in a way that is not just someone who's heard about the Pharisees, not someone who has you know, taken a, a quote or two out of context, someone who's lived it and breathed it. But at the same time, you know, the guy was supervising the death of the first Christian martyr. The guy uh, has gone from place to place and has been persecuting Christians the whole way along. As you might imagine, the, the, the Christians in Jerusalem who didn't see all this transition with their own eyes are a little bit suspicious of him. And uh, so you take Barnabas, who saw him before, who saw, you know, saw, knew who Paul was before he came to be a Christian, knew him as he was a Christian in Damascus, and now could advocate for him. And, and that's vitally important. So what that means is that when someone comes to be a Christian, we need to realize, especially if they were significantly against it, there are huge, huge social pressures at work there. And we as Christians need to, one, uh, not, not be so undiscerning that um, you let in somebody who is trying to deceive and trying to, to kind of trick you into thinking that they've changed. Uh, but we need to not also be antagonistic towards such a person because if we do that, then all we do is encourage them uh, to believe the worst about Christians. So it's just uh, the story of, of Paul transitioning uh, from being a Pharisee to being a committed Christian. It's just a fascinating thing. And I think there's so much going on there socially. <laughs> you know, What does it mean to do something like that that I think is vitally important for, for us as Christians to remember and keep in mind and realize that none of us, none of us come to faith in a vacuum. It's, we're all affected by all the things that are around us, and, and coming to faith is one unbelievably important thing, but it's not the only thing in someone's life, and those other things are still relevant, uh, even if they are of a lesser significance. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have more of uh, the Book of Acts. Have a good day.